Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about how to be a Shiro in everyday life. I'm delighted to welcome special guest Lauren Nelson. Lauren is the author of Shiro's of the Bible and is passionate about sharing the stories of these heroic women to inspire young and old with the faith to overcome their fears. You can reach Lauren at her website, laurennelson.com, and on Facebook and Instagram at Shiro's of the Bible. And I'll include the links in the description. Welcome, Lauren. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am so grateful that you're here and that you're willing to share your story. And I understand that you endured your abuse survivor. Would you yes. mind sharing your story and how you, where you came from and how you got to where you created this beautiful book? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised with loving parents. I had a mom and a dad and a, and a twin sister. And uh, we were both very loved. I remember my dad teaching us Bible stories from a young age, and it instilled this deep love uh, of the Bible. And he was so expressive as he would read these stories, and it was just wonderful. So um, great, great upbringing. Um, but for me, the abuse happened by extended family members. And so when my family would get on an airplane and fly to another um, state, we would visit these extended family members. And when we were there, some other extended family members ended up um, coming in the middle of the night to take my sister and I out when my parents and everybody else were sleeping. So, um, yeah, it was a very um, secretive thing. This person you know, he, it was him and his wife actually that would come and, and take, it would take my sister and I. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they were very different people during the day than at night. And I really remember liking, liking him. Um, I don't remember his wife as much, but you know, I remember liking him during the day, but at night he was a very different person. And so he would come, um, take my sister and I and drive us actually to another location that was, I don't know, you know, a few miles away. Um, and at this other location, there was satanic rituals happening. And, uh, so he, when they would bring us there, there would be other people there practicing these things as well. So it was in a group. Um, there were other men and women, um, and unfortunately other children that were brought there. Um, and at these, at these, you know, rituals, there were just really horrendous things done um, emotionally and mentally, like there was mental abuse. Um, there was, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse that would happen during these events. Um, and I was probably around the age between four and six years old when this happened. And it happened on a, on a number of occasions. Yeah. So I was quite young. Um, my sister too. And so, you know, as a young child, having these things seeing the things that we witnessed um, was just absolutely terrifying. And the enemy really wanted to make himself seem more powerful than God. And that was one of the biggest things that they wanted to instill was that, that Satan is more, more powerful. But praise Jesus, while the enemy was making himself known to me, the Lord was making himself known to me as well. And I was having dreams as a little girl of my calling and what God had for me. And I remember at the age of four, having a dream where I am literally uh, shouting out to my, to, well, I must've been five, to my kindergarten class, just crying out to them, telling them that they were in danger and that God had something more for them. And, um, and it was, it was, it was a fairly graphic dream because, you know, it was very dark, but the Lord was very, making it very clear to me, even at that young age, like you have a calling to set the captives free and to tell people about me and tell them that, that the enemy is a liar and that Jesus is bigger and he is stronger and he can set anyone free from anything. It doesn't matter how dark, it doesn't matter how deep um, the wound or the pain or the sin, he can set you free from it. And so um, he made himself really, really known to me from a young, from the age of, of a young girl. And I remember even at the age of seven, um, I, I was raised Lutheran. And so I had this old Lutheran hymnal and I remember just being in my room and reading this Lutheran hymnal. And there was a specific song 
called This Is, I don't remember what it's called, but it's This Is the Feast. And it's talking about, you know, a feast of victory for God. And I remember just crying as I was reading this, just experiencing God's love. So he made himself really, really clear to me. But like most, you know, abuse survivors, a lot of childhood abuse survivors, we um, repress our memories because it's so horrible that how you survive is you have to forget. And I know that I was told that I would be killed if I told anybody, um, my family would be killed. And so I repressed my memories until I was in junior high school. And I was basically entering, I think it was seventh grade when um, I began to remember. And then my sister started remembering at the same time. And for me, the, it, the memories came back like a torrential flood of fear. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I could not, uh, I couldn't walk out to the mailbox to get the mail. I couldn't walk down the street. I thought I would be kidnapped and killed. I, I mean, it was a very real fear. And, and, you know, some people, I remember people saying, you know, I can't remember the wording that they would use, but that's, that's not a, that's not realistic, or that's not like a, a real fear. You kind of need to get over it. And I'm thinking, you don't know, like, I actually, it's very real. Like I experienced that. Um, I was kidnapped, you know? Yes, and you so, you know, and so it's just, it's, um, it, it was just a really hard time. And I had a lot of nightmares, a lot of just memories. I remember at one point, you know, just hyperventilating because of a memory that came back and my parents having to get me like a paper bag, you know, to try to like regain my breathing. So during those memories, when they came back, you know, my sister responded very different than me. She talked with a counselor, my mom, you know, my, my parents knew about it. Um, they were really supportive and helping us through this. We had a counselor. Um, but so my sister was great talking with the counselor processing with my mom, but for me, I pushed everybody else away. Like I was so angry, uh, and rageful. I did mean things to my family. I was angry with my sister. And that was one of the things during the abuse is that um, we were pit against each other during some of the the abuse. So um, I was, you know, made to feel like I was dominant, the dominant one to kind of push her down. And it just was horrible. It's just horrible. Anything they can do to divide and um, just come against God's children, that's what they did. And so I just felt really angry with her. Um, And so, um, you know, the only one that I really let into my heart was Jesus. And he just knocked on the door of my heart so gently from the time I was young. But then also just, um, I remember reading the Chronicles of Narnia. And um, for those of you who don't know Aslan, um, when when C.S. Lewis wrote the book, he wanted to portray Aslan as Jesus. That's Jesus. And so he wanted to show us, you know, kind of some attributes of Jesus and make him very real to us and to children. And to me, I experienced Jesus through the Chronicles of Narnia and that escape into the wardrobe. And I just wanted to escape life. And so that was my escape. Um, But yeah, so my, my relationship with Jesus was very private, very personal. But when I went to college, um, it became public because I heard a preacher um, speak at my college campus And he shared the full gospel. He shared that Jesus died for me. I mean, I'd heard things like that before, again, growing up in church, but this was like not watered down. I mean, this was the full gospel. And so he said, I don't, if you want to receive Jesus, don't just raise your hand. I want you to boldly stand up and say, I'm going to follow him. And I didn't even have to think about it. I was all of a sudden I was on my feet and I'm looking around and there's so many other people standing. And it, it was just this from my from that moment forward, my life was changed. It was different. And I got plugged into a church. And at that church, I met some wonderful people who heard my story, my testimony and prayed with me through every last memory that would continue to arise because my memories didn't stop in middle school. They continued to come through college and even, you know, into adulthood. And so they prayed with me through every fear, every, every shame, um, that every, every way that I felt shame and dirty. And, and during those prayer times, that's when I really began to experience Jesus even more that he was with me through it all, that he was with me, um, through the abuse that he doesn't shy away from suffering, that he doesn't shy away from the pain that he will get in deep, into the mess with you 
to protect your heart and to help you through it. And so that is exactly what he did. And um, so I experienced the Lord's love through people, which was really healing. And then also through my husband, when I met my husband, that was just another area of healing. And um, when you're fully known and you're fully loved, um, it's just so healing. And yeah, so that was my, that was the, you know, for me, the rooting of that fear. And then as I um, had kids, I had, I have, I have a son and a daughter. I have a nine-year-old son and a 13-year-old daughter now, but when they were little, Um, I was dealing with a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression because, you know, even though I had really dealt with a lot of the spiritual implications, it does take an effect and a toll on your body. Absolutely. And yeah. And so you can, you can get uh, a lot of people that have gone through, you know, traumatic experiences, especially as a child, it, It's when you're developing your hormones and your cortisol levels are getting all out of whack through it and serotonin levels. And so my body was going crazy after having children. Um, You know, that's a trauma too to your body. And so having having kiddos, uh, my anxiety was going really, really bad. And so I was even having a hard time getting out of bed, you know, each day, but I would make that choice to get out of bed and, and love my kids. My husband was actually a pastor at the time. And so we, we were, he was associate pastor. Um, so we were helping to pastor a church. So I'm, we're saying yes every day to that, but it was hard. And I remember one night, um, and this is what, you know, is really just a huge testimony for how the book really came to be is one night, uh, my husband and I, I was really struggling and he said, let's, let's pray. Let's just ask God if there's anything that he wants to speak to our hearts about you and about what you're struggling with. And so I said, okay, let's, yeah, let's do it. And so we prayed and, you know, bowed our heads for a couple of minutes, just trying to listen quietly to see if there was anything he wanted to kind of share with us. And my husband lifted his head and he said, I hear the Lord calling you an author. And I almost laughed out loud in disbelief because I, yeah, it reminds me of Sarah, right? Sarah from the Bible who laughed when the Lord told her that she was going to be pregnant and she was like 90 years old. And, but for me, I just, I, I thought there's no way I can barely put one foot in front of the other. I've never been a particularly gifted writer. My sister is a great writer. Um, but, but me Lord, you know? And so, um, But my husband said, Lauren, like, let's declare that God can do the impossible. He can do anything that he wants. And so I'm like, okay, yes, Lord, I declare you can do the impossible. You can use little old me if this is what you want to do. So about a year later, so this isn't by nothing that I made happen because I seriously had a lot of unbelief, but I, I was like, okay, God, and I released it. But a year later, I'm driving in the car with my daughter. And in my church that we were um, helping pastor, we had been, they had really been talking about Kairos moments. And what a Kairos moment is, is really when God impacts, like he literally intervenes in your day and you just know that it's him talking to you. Like, it's like a lightning strike. You're just like, whoa, like there's something in that. (laughs) That's a Kairos moment. And so we were learning about Kairos moments and we were learning that when that happens, that we're supposed to ask two questions. We're supposed to say, God, what are you speaking to me and what am I going to do about it? Because there's power in taking action. And so I had a Kairos moment in the car with my daughter. We're driving on our way to church. My son's in the car too. And my daughter says, mom, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, you asked me lots of questions. What's up? And she said, why are boys more important than girls? And I was so shocked because I'm a pretty strong-willed person and she is too. And I just, I thought, where's that coming from? And I said, why, why would you ask that? And she said, mom, it just seems like God thinks that boys are more important than girls because all we ever learn about in church are boys. And I said, well, what about Esther and, you know, Hannah? And I'm mentioning a few people that I just, you know, love. And she goes, yeah, I mean, I've heard of them, but we don't like talk about them every week. Like we talk about the men. And I, and it just really struck me. And so I got on Google like anyone would, right? And I'm like, okay, let's find a book, a children's book about the women of the Bible. And at the time, there were only two books that came up. And those two books were not bad books. They're great, but they were um, portraying the women as princesses and really more like 
meek and mild, you know, kind of say, saying like uh, princess of peace or the princess like Abigail's the princess of peace because she she helped with a confrontation with 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 David and, and uh, Nabal. And so she was considered the princess of peace. Well, that's fine. That's not bad. And a lot of kids relate to princesses. But there's also a lot of kids that don't. And my daughter loved strength and strong, like heroic people. And that's more what I was drawn to about the people in the Bible, the women in the Bible. And so um, the other thing was that these, every illustration was Caucasian. And to me, that just wasn't accurate. It's, it's not, um, it's not, not just inclusive. It just wasn't, it wasn't something that if this was to go around the world, what, what do other kids think when they're reading these books in Africa or India or China or even in America? And they look at these stories and do they, do they subtly get the impression that God only uses Caucasian people? And so I thought, I don't want them to have that underlying message because that's not accurate. And it's not Caucasian people. Like in, in uh, Israel, they're not Caucasian. And so, you know, I thought, gosh, like that really bothers me. So I thought I'm going to, when I started writing these stories and my daughter was loving them, I realized I think other kids have these, this may have this same question, even if they haven't been able to articulate it. And so I, um, I came to realize that this was, you know, a a bigger thing and that I needed to write a book. And so it was quite a long journey. I ended up self-publishing the first part of the book, just the Old Testament. And then um, down the road, this during COVID, you know, I wrote the, the New Testament women and a publisher, a traditional publisher picked it up and said, I love it. And um, let's put them together in one book, Old Testament and New Testament. And it's called She Rose of the Bible. And it has 20, uh, 20 stories and 26 women from the New Testament and the Old Testament that um, changed history. And, and, the, and the coolest part about it, the main thing that unites these women and what I found as a common thread in their story, it, in all of their stories, is their overcoming fear. And that each of them experienced fear in a very different way. Like some of them, it was fear for their lives, like they were going to die. Um, for others, there was fear that um, they weren't going to have a child like Hannah, you know, that she was never going to have children, but she surrendered that fear to the Lord. And then he ended up blessing her with five more kids. And so just just so many stories of conquering that fear through their trust in Jesus. And I thought, I can relate to this. And I want kids to read this and realize and know that they know that they know that Jesus is bigger than any fear they will ever face, um, that he is always going to be there. He will be their constant. He will be um, their stronghold and their safe place. So that's really the journey on, on how I wrote She Rose of the Bible. I love it. I think the story behind the story shows another Shiro, and that is you. (laughs) Thank you. So thank you, and I think it's amazing that you were able to overcome your fear with faith. That's so beautiful, and I'm so thankful that there were people in your life that supported you and that you were able to find, find help and to have people who prayed with you through each of your fears and each of those memories. Because that's so deep and so entrenched at such a young age. So let's see. I would love, would you share some of the stories that maybe maybe are, are less well known or something that just was so exciting to learn about? Yes, great question. Um, I love um, the story of Shifra and Pua. And not a, I had never heard of them before. Some people maybe have heard of them that's listening. But um, I had never heard their story before. They're in the book of Exodus. And um, they were midwives uh, during in Egypt um, when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And um, and they basically the Pharaoh told them, hey, you need to kill every newborn baby boy. That's an Israelite baby boy. You need to kill it when when it's born, because uh, the Israelites are going to get too big. They're going to form an army and they're going to kill us. So we want to make sure that all the boys are killed. And so these two women, Shifra and Pua, said in their hearts, they said, no, um, God is bigger and God is stronger. And I fear him more than I fear the Pharaoh. And so they, in secret, they actually helped the women deliver healthy baby boys and then hide them. Um, They helped the women um, to do that. And so they, they ended up saving the lives of who knows how many kids. Um, and Moses was born during that time. So they, they very well could have, 
been a part of, so they were the head midwives, but they also led other women in doing this as well. So they, they had a, that was their way of saying no and talk about facing their fears because they could have easily have been killed if they were found out, but the Lord protected them. And uh, they had a great story when they came before Pharaoh, they said, oh, I don't know why these, these Israelite women are so strong. They're having babies before we get there. And so, you know, there was just, they, God gave them the wisdom that they needed to face the Pharaoh and to do what God had asked them to do. So I love that story. That um, is fantastic. Yeah, one. that is one that I'm not familiar with. I've read the Old Testament cover to cover, but there's a lot in there. And I think I forgot like 99% of it. Oh, easy. <laughs> yeah. And then there's another gal, speaking of the Old Testament, that I love that is just such an easy story to skip over. Um, but I, I, I just felt like God really wanted me to put it in there. And it's a, it's a girl who actually, we don't even know her name. She doesn't, I mean, she obviously had a name, but we don't know what her name was. Um, and so I actually got to name her after my daughter for my book oh. because she didn't have a name and she needed a name. And so that's why my daughter got to be in the book, which is really fun. And I do make that clear in the book that she didn't have a name uh, and that I'm the one, you know, I said, let's just call her Kaya. Oh. Um, but she did an amazing thing. She, um, everybody was fleeing for their lives. They were terrified of this king that was going to come and kill um, this entire village in a village of Thebes. Um, and so everyone had gone and they've hidden in this, this big, huge tower and they were terrified, um, hiding for their lives. And Kaya was in the tower and she was hiding with her family when she realized that there was a big, huge millstone in the window. And, and millstones are huge. Um, they're gi gigantic rocks. And, um, and so she pushed it with all her might. She had seen that the, that the bad evil king was just below the window far down. And so she pushed out the millstone and it landed on him and he died and all of his army ran away in fear. They, they were done. So all of her village was saved because she chose to do something. She chose to take action because how many people would just be like, oh yeah, there's a stone, but I'm terrified. Like I can't move. And what can little old me do? I'm just a girl. I'm just you know, who knows how old she was. She was, it sounded like she was young. And so, but she didn't, she pushed it out and, and saved everybody. That is amazing. Wow. Yeah, I love, that story. That I love the Old Testament. That's why I, I wrote the Old Testament first. Cause that's like my, I was just one of my passions. But then as I was writing the New Testament, there's so many amazing women. I mean, the woman at the well, um, when I was doing research, she, in church history, her name is Fatini or Fatina. And so I never even knew she had a name. And so it was really cool. So I got to name her Fotini. And, um, and you know, we talk about her story and how she was so rejected and so um, alone. And, you know, one of the reasons that she went to the well at the time that she did was because um, she was rejected. All the other women usually went at a different time during the day. And that's just a cultural, you know, knowledge of knowing when the women would go to the to the well. But she was known for having had multiple husbands and um, she was very rejected. And if you think about it, why did she have multiple husbands? She would have had to have been divorced. She didn't get a chance. She didn't get to make that decision to be divorced or not. Um, so she experienced rejection from men and women. And the Lord Jesus, when he was walking, he encountered her and it was not by accident and it was very purposeful. And he spoke life into her and he told her who she was and that he was living water for her. And she, she was, she just couldn't believe it. She was so excited that she had met the Messiah that she ran into her village and told everybody and said, come and meet a man who told me everything I've ever did. And he, and she brought her whole village back and they all came to, to know the Lord because of her testimony, because she went and got them and told them about Jesus. And so she was an evangelist. That's fantastic. So in that story, it kind of brings back the idea that she was rejected, but yeah. not by Jesus. Right. And I love the idea that you felt inspired, that this is something oh. of telling these women's story was inspired by God. Because people believe that women aren't as important in God's eyes. And I right. have felt that way before too. So I am so grateful that you're helping people to be able to open their eyes because we don't have all of the answers, but just something simple like he doesn't reject, he accepts, he loves, he cares, and yes. he cares about each one of us individually. And that's such an important thing to remember. So what a beautiful, beautiful story. 
and oh, telling these stories, you're, you're helping people to be able to find the strength and of, of saying, ah, look at that wonderful thing that she did. And I can do wonderful things too. And having yes. that just build their faith. That is so, so, so beautiful. Yeah. And that is my heart in sharing the story of, of how this book came to be and my, my story, my history of, you know, trauma, you know, is that anyone who's listening that, that you would know that Jesus did that with me, he can do it with you. And what he has called for you, what he has as a calling in your life may look different, but it's just as powerful and just as awesome. And it's just saying yes daily to Jesus and what he's asking you to do, even if it's uncomfortable. And I would love to share one thing too. Um, I had a friend who um, was struggling with some addiction and she had gone to counseling and she was meeting with a counselor and her counselor said to her, he said this, which I just will never forget. He said, what's on the other side of fear? And she said, I don't know. And he said, everything you've ever wanted. Wow. Everything God has for you, everything you've ever desired is on the other side of that bully fear. And so for me, it was learning that how do I get to that other side? And this is for everyone listening. Like, how do you get to the other side of fear? It's by saying yes to Jesus one day at a time. And by asking yourself the question, what is God saying to me? And what am I going to do about it? And it's those daily yeses to saying yes to taking my pen to paper and starting to just write some really crazy sounding stories that didn't sound that great. And then realizing that God gave me a sister who's an excellent writer. And so asking for some help and some, some, you know, tidbits on how to write, she helped me find my voice to where I didn't need her help anymore. Um, you know, I, and so it's just somebody needed to hold my hand for a while in the beginning because it's scary and it's hard to step out and, and be vulnerable. And even just speaking and being on this podcast or, you know, doing speaking events for women's events and things, it, it, that was terrifying to me in the beginning. And, you know, I remember telling people, hey, you know, have you, if you've ever heard, you know, would you rather like die or be in front of people? <laughs> you know, public speaking. And I would easily have said, I think I'd rather die because I felt like I was being led to death every time I would have to get in front of a group of people and share. But, but by saying yes, because God said I needed to do it, I needed to make my story known and I needed to share it by saying those daily yeses, even when I'm uncomfortable, um, he, you're conquering fear one bit at a time and you're making it over to that other side. And on that other side, I'm not there, you know, it's not like I'm saying I've arrived by any means because God has even more for me on that other side, but it's through saying those daily yeses. So I just encourage you that that the the enemy is a bully and he does want to keep you scared and keep you um, quiet and keep you, um, you know, just isolated. But God wants you to say yes to what he's asking you to do. And it's different for everybody. And he speaks to us gently and he whispers to us through scripture. Sometimes he whispers to us through a conversation with a friend, or maybe it's even this podcast where you're going to say, this is my Kairos moment. God is talking to me. And then it's asking yourself, okay, what is he saying to me through this podcast? And what am I going to do about it? And that's your first step to conquer that fear. That is beautiful. Just by saying yes, 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 and doing it and moving forward. It reminds me just a little bit of the parable of the wise man and the foolish man, where um, he talks about, you know, a wise man built his house on a rock, foolish man built his house on the sand, and then the storms came and the winds blew and the house on the rock stood still and the house on the sand washed away. But a lot of people who know that story don't pay attention to what made the wise man wise and what made the foolish man foolish. And he says, yeah. whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them yes. is likened unto a wise man. And whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not is likened unto a foolish man. It is that combination of learning and doing. And your yes. learning is coming through your inspiration as you open yourself and allow those thoughts and those feelings to come in and recognizing the source, which is fantastic, and then taking the next step and acting on it. Sometimes yeah. people maybe hear something and think, I can't do that. I, I don't know how to write. I, I don't know how to do this. And then they Absolutely. say that, then it falls apart. And so they don't get to have that strong foundation that you're building as you learn and do and learn yeah. and do. 
And it's so beautiful, these talents that you personally are, are gaining and creating. Like, I can't write. Oh, I can. I'm actually pretty good at it. And right. I can't speak. Well, actually, I can. And I'm actually pretty good at it. And by sharing my story, who knows how many lives you're blessing and who knows how many people feel like, she said that exactly for me. Yes. Out of the, this whole audience, she was speaking to me, to my heart, to my story, to my experience. And that is so beautiful and amazing. So Amen. thank you. Well done. Oh, thank you for letting me share that. And I, I do pray that people are encouraged by this. Oh, I, I am. So I, <laughs> I imagine everybody else is too. Good. All right. Um, I, I have been so delighted. I've been looking forward to this conversation. When I first read that this was your topic, I thought, oh, I'm so excited to be able to hear this. And I'm excited that these types of stories are being shared. Yeah. And that was before I knew the rest of your story and your personal fear and overcoming. So two-part whammy. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And, and I should uh, clarify that um, uh, my book will be in bookstores in December. So Exciting. how you get a copy now is through my website. So I do have copies and I personally sign them and you get a bookmark and you know, fun stuff like that. So Fantastic. if you're interested. And that's the, the website that I shared at the beginning and I'll make sure to Yeah, Lauren down. L. Nelson. Okay. Thank com. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, in closing, I'd like to share a quote by Harry Emerson Fosdick. He said, fear imprisons. Faith liberates. Fear paralyzes. Faith empowers. Fear disheartens. Faith encourages. Fear sickens. Faith heals. Fear makes useless. Faith makes serviceable. Today, I invite you to choose faith over fear. See you next time on Linda's Corner.